tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Indigenous advocates rally to condemn police brutality. They shoot and kill our daughters and leave them in the streets. They didn't deserve to die. The emotional toll and the calls for change also. A massive injection of cash for TransLink. Uh, we have to act now to stabilize TransLink's finances. Why the province is stepping in with financial help and tech and retail out, offices in. So we're at a time of change and I think that's really clear. Um, but we're really hopeful and positive that Vancouver's got a lot to offer. The changing landscape of downtown Vancouver. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Michelle Gassoub. Anita is away tonight. BC's newest energy project faces more questions tonight about its compatibility with the province's climate goals. The government has pledged to reduce oil and gas emissions significantly by 2030. But as John Hernandez reports, some climate experts say the new Cedar LNG project is a step backwards. Just weeks before he was sworn in, BC's incoming premier said, We cannot continue to subsidize fossil fuels and expect a transition to a clean energy future. A quote critics say gravely contradicts the approval of BC's latest liquefied natural gas project. BC continues to be a jurisdiction that, a jurisdiction that wants to have its cake and eat it too. Cedar LNG, a Kitimat facility proposed by the Heisla Nation, would liquefy about 3 million tons of LNG per year for export to Asian markets. The project was granted an environmental assessment certificate on Tuesday. The choice between protecting the environment and creating good jobs is a false one. We see a better way. BC has legislated substantial reductions to greenhouse gas emissions over the next three decades, including a 38% reduction in oil and gas emissions by 2030. Some climate experts say Cedar LNG doesn't align at all with the targets. We are a fossil fuel mining province, and we, and we kind of ignore that when we come up with our climate change plans. In response, BC also launched an energy action framework stipulating the new facility hit zero emissions by 2030. But there are concerns it doesn't address emissions in other parts of the supply chain. You're still sh shipping natural gas to, to, to Asia and it's getting burnt, so you're still causing larger greenhouse gas emissions. There will also be an emissions cap, but opposition members are left wondering what it will be. When we were asking questions about uh, some of the details, uh, they're yet to be determined. Still, members of the Heisla Nation contend LNG is the most viable option when it comes to expanding their resource sector and preserving the land. There's a reason why my band did not go down the road of solar and wind. There's just too many unanswered questions. There was too much land impact. Despite both optimism and concern, there are no guarantees yet that this project will go through, with investment decisions still up for debate. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. At the centre of the debate around LNG is the question of the economy and the climate and whether you can balance both. Some experts believe so, pointing to other successful examples of First Nations communities who have benefited from economic development within renewable energy industries. In Treaty 8 territory, the Solto First Nation um, has recently built a, a 15 megawatt uh, wind farm and that project, um, the Sakuna wind energy project created jobs in that community and you know those wind tur turbines are going to be producing energy for many many years to come. A warning for our viewers, this next story contains some disturbing details. RCMP are investigating after 17 wild horses were shot and killed in a remote area of BC. Police say the dead horses were found on provincial crown land north of Wallachine, about 65 kilometres from Kamloops. The department says the wild horses were from a herd that often visited the area. The bodies of the horses were all found within two kilometres of each other and police beef the car carcasses had been left on the site for days before being found. 
Indigenous and black communities joined together today in memory of those lost to violence at the hands of police. This comes as groups across the country are marking the International Day Against Police Brutality. As Yasmin Gandam reports, parents and advocates are calling for action and accountability. He didn't deserve to die. <laughs> Sobs could be heard throughout the room. Mothers remembering their sons and daughters. Speaking at the opening of an art exhibit on the downtown east side featuring the names of those who have died. I don't want my great grandson to have to think that he's going to face being shot down in the street. Laura Holland's son, Jared, was shot and killed by RCMP officers in Campbell River outside of Tim Hortons in July of 2021. She says it was a senseless tragedy. I don't feel any shame about who my son was. I don't feel any shame about who he was as a person, as a man, as a father. BC's police watchdog has since found reasonable grounds for possible charges against the three officers. Other parents hope they too will find justice for their loved ones. He was so loving and so kind and so respectful. Julian Jones was a 28-year-old who was shot in Tofino by an RCMP officer in February of 2021. The IIO launched an investigation and stated there were no grounds to believe that any officer committed an offense. His family disheartened. Julian's life matters. His life matters. A report by the organization Tracking Injustice shows 141 British Columbians died from police force since 2000, including a record 19 people in 2022. And in a statement, the IIO says they currently have 70 open investigations across the province. But some criminology experts say prevention is difficult without adequate resources and training. These are emotionally charged events that are very hard to prevent. The only way you can reduce the fatality element is by helping the police officers to be aware uh, and, and come up with techniques for handling their own aggression. CBC reached out to the RCMP for comment but did not hear back. Meanwhile, these families wait for answers and change without loved ones by their side. <laughs> <laughs> Yasmin Gandam, CBC News, Vancouver. The provincial government has stepped in with nearly half a billion dollars in emergency funding for TransLink. The funding will make up for decreased revenue from low ridership levels sparked by the pandemic. Today, Premier David Eby announced $479 million to TransLink to avoid cuts and keep transit service reliable. At the height of the pandemic, ridership plunged on the transit system and it still hasn't bounced back. In 2020, TransLink received $644 million in provincial and federal funding to help cover pandemic losses. Now TransLink has once again asked for help. The new bailout is from BC's surplus fund from this fiscal year. Ridership is coming back, uh, but slower than we would like. But what we definitely don't want to do right now is have uh, TransLink cut back services, cause people not to come back to transit because the service simply isn't there for them, causing fewer people to choose transit, causing further cutbacks because of reduced revenue. Despite the latest funding, there are also calls from the federal government to step up and help with future funding. Well, earlier this month, Nordstrom announced they would be exiting Canada, leaving a big hole in Vancouver's retail scene. And while many are speculating about what could fill that gap, Justin McElroy reports that a lot of the city's economic energy these days is on sectors other than retail. Is the city of Vancouver concerned about what will fill one of the biggest retail spaces in the city? Not really. We will bounce back at that location. I'm sure something great is going to go in there and we'll continue on. Ken Sim making those comments not from Vancouver, but Austin, Texas. It's the amount of people from international community gathered here to build bridges. There might not be a bigger yearly event for tech and the new economy than South by Southwest in Austin. And it certainly fits with the mayor's focus. We really want to tell the world that Vancouver is open for business. And what businesses are Sim focusing on? Well, technology with a big focus on XR, like augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, green tech, uh, um, 
and uh, you know uh, the, the, blo the blockchain. And why? Every single company, regardless of what you do, has a tech focus. And if you don't, you're not going to be around for long. And so um, coming down to self by getting immersed in the new technologies and helping them roll out. Call it tech bro buzz if you want, but the focus of Vancouver's economic push these days is pretty buzzy. You've got big events coming like FIFA and people getting ready for that. There's a change in how we're doing our work. Um, so hybrid working, more tech and innovation, digitalization of storefront. So we're in a time of change. The Vancouver Economic Commission looks at a lot of data to see where trends are going. And a couple things are clear at the moment. For one, the city needs more office space, especially when you compare it with other Canadian hubs. It's partly why most of the big downtown developments lately have been office based, from the Amazon Post to the Deloitte building to the new Microsoft office. Secondly, when it comes to retail, the strong areas these days aren't actually in the city of Vancouver, but in the suburbs, and it might stay that way for a while. We're very aware that there's shifts. People are working from home more in the suburbs, so there's more demand um, for retail and hospitality there. Add it up, and you can make an argument that downtown Vancouver is in the midst of a realignment, moving away from retail and more to a job and tech center. I, I would agree, and uh, you know, I, I think people have to realize that you know, there's a different way of looking at it as well. Uh, you know, everything's tech. So yes, there's discussion about Nordstrom's. I have hope, hopeful optimism that it's a very central flagship location. Um, and so looking that that will be a new tenant will come quickly. But it's non-retail sectors that are on the mayor's mind these days. Personal trip, I'm actually going down and adding a couple of days to meet uh, executives in the movie industry in LA on Friday and Saturday. Justin McElroy, CBC News. Vancouver. A major recall from Honda tonight that includes some of its most popular vehicles. The automaker is recalling more than 50,000 vehicles in Canada and nearly half a million more in the U.S. It covers several makes and models from 2017 to 2020. Honda says the issue is the front seat belt, seat belt may not latch properly and it says there have been no injuries as of yet. The woman charged with mischief after interrupting Avril Lavigne's Juno performance while topless appeared in an Edmonton courtroom today. I think to get people's attention, you got to do something drastic. I knew that that would be a great headline. Um, I low-key, in my heart of hearts, hoped that she would be like punk rock, girl power, give me the mic or something. But I, I don't think it could have gone any better. The Vancouver woman is with a group called On to Ottawa, whose goal is to demand government action on climate change. The 37-year-old had a ticket to the event, and she says she was surprised by how easy it was to get on the stage. Her next court appearance is April 5th. Now to Canada's shifting housing market. The latest numbers show home sales dropped dramatically in February, down 40% year over year. And the average price was also down nearly 19% over that same period. But that doesn't paint the full picture. Sales actually increased slightly from January to February. So the question is, does this mean the market is stabilizing or is it a blip? Our Anis Haidari looked at what could happen next. A new home in Oakville, Ontario. The goal for this couple. Owning means that, you know, this is your place. You call it your home. You stay here long term. You know, you, you decorate it the way you want to Do decorate. whatever you want to. But it's hard to find a place. Also, I think we are seeing some tough competition at the moment because the supply is less and there are more buyers in the market. More buyers? Maybe. In total, less money is being spent, at least when compared to last year, when interest rates were still rock bottom. Those have changed which means prices are dropping. Well, I think it's going to take a little bit more time to see that type of froth uh, uh, coming back, and which is not a bad thing, really, uh, because you know, we're still looking at you know, very steep prices uh, uh, in certain parts of the country. Housing prices in parts of Ontario and B.C. have dropped from their highest points, but they're still much higher than before the pandemic. And markets like Calgary, Regina and St. John's are notably still close to their peak prices. But there is less to buy these days. Newly listed properties down in February compared to January. The majority of people, even if they want to move, they're staying put because they're too scared of these high rates. They're too scared of, you know, what, what they're going to get for their own house. Is their house even going to sell? And so we're not seeing that many listings. Those high interest rates could stay put, but a pause on interest rate hikes might encourage buyers and sellers to jump back into the market. 
While it doesn't have data yet, the Canadian Real Estate Association says it expects more properties to be ready for the market in the spring. Anise Hedari, CBC News, Calgary. One of Canada's most recognizable news anchors is breaking her silence. Tonight on The National, a CBC News exclusive, Chief Correspondent Adrienne Arsenault talks with Lisa Laflamme about her controversial exit and her next chapter. And we have a sneak peek to share with you. You talked about feeling blindsided. That was a word that you used. Was there absolutely no hint that this was coming? Everything in that tweet stands to this day. Blindsided. As I said, I think you live this same reality. In daily news, I would wake up every single day and have no idea what would happen between the moment I woke up and when I ended up back in my home uh, after midnight. The same was true that day. You adapt to whatever it is, and that is what we are trained to do, is, is react to sudden change. And uh, when I put it in perspective, and I do all the time, I think about, you know, the soldiers who we saw lose their legs in Afghanistan, or, you know, babies born in tarpaulins after the earthquake in Haiti. All of these things, those are sudden changes they don't come back from. We do. And I've said it before, I'll say it again, the comeback is better than the setback. See the full interview on The National tonight at 7 p.m. on CBC TV and streaming on CBC Gem and CBC News Explore. And our Radio-Canada colleague, uh, Jules Desjardins, joins us now for a look at the forecast. Uh, Jules, we have been so spoiled this week with the sunshine. Yeah, it was, particularly this morning, it was a big blue sky with temperatures still below average. But look what I saw uh, while going to have a, a walk and also grab a coffee. The first cherry blossom in my neighborhood, uh, it, it changed my mood automatically with the big blue sky behind it. That was nice. Uh, we're not over yet with the winter though, because the, the, the north, we have this low pressure system that will bring some moisture and rain and mixed with snow. It's a little bit colder in that area. For the southwest, we can't have uh, scattered showers for the next few minutes, for the next, next few hours, but we can see barely a high pressure system that will slide into the province and help us to have a clear sky for tomorrow in the afternoon. Uh, this is the movement that we'll have. We'll still have that low pressure in up north. And look on the south, it's clearing up in the afternoon. And for most of the province, we're going to see a big blue sky, especially also for the north uh, part and the west part of uh, Vancouver Island. It's going to be a beautiful day for tomorrow. The temperatures are going to be similar on, of what we had this morning. Up north, this is the rain amount, very low. We have probably five to six centimeters of, of, of snow during the night. Uh, the rain is mostly placed on the northwest of the province. Tomorrow, in the morning, it might be mostly uh, cloudy. After that, it's going to be sunny, mostly sunny, very rapidly in the afternoon. The temperatures are going to reach the double digit and probably stay that way for the next few days. And even we're going to have a raise of the temperatures uh, for the next few days. Uh, mostly cloudy and in, um, in, in the morning for the Okanagan. After that, we're going to have uh, mostly sunny, mostly sunny for the southwest of the province. Uh, up north, we still have some snow, but at the end of the afternoon, it will clear up uh, and we'll see mostly cloud for the northeast and it will be slower to have a beautiful sky for that region. For the next few days, we can expect temperatures to rise a little bit, even uh, above uh, seasonal. Uh, for Sunday, it's a few shower, but uh, at least for two or three days, we have the sun and nice temperatures everywhere. All right, beautiful. And we will be on the lookout for those cherry blossoms. Thanks, Jude. Yeah, bye-bye. Our very own Johanna Wagstaff is back with another episode of the CBC Explore series, Planet Wonder. This time, she explores how animals are being forced to adapt to climate change. She headed to the BC Wildlife Park in Kamloops to ask the question, do we need to be cold-blooded for our warmer climate? Here's a preview. We're live? 
I'm here at BC Wildlife Park with breaking news. Climate change is affecting all animals, but in different ways. I'm here with Pippin the goat to get some perspective. Pippin, how do you plan on regulating your body temperature during the next heat dome? Uh, what are your plans for a warmer world? Have you done any preparations? Yeah, I'm working on getting answers, but I'm gonna stay on this developing story. Back to you in studio. Clear. What we do know is that mammals have a hard time regulating their body temperature in excessive heat. We also know reptiles exist in extreme climates, so that got me wondering. Do we need to be cold-blooded for a warmer world? As kids, most of us learned that the animal kingdom can be divided into two groups, cold-blooded and warm-blooded. But those terms are inaccurate, implying that animals are in a never-ending struggle to stay warm or cool. Get ready for Ectotherm versus Endotherm 101 with Wagstaff. Ectothermic animals, like reptiles and amphibians, rely on the external environment to regulate their body temperatures. If it's too hot, these animals seek cooler places, and if it's too cold, they may find a sunny spot to warm up. They can also slow down their metabolisms, reducing their need to seek food until environmental conditions improve. Endotherms, like mammals, birds, and us humans, regulate body temperatures by producing heat within the body. But that takes a lot of energy, aka food. And that means they have to slog through rougher conditions, like extreme heat, because they can't power down the furnace or AC unit. Before we find out if we'll be living under a reptile overlord someday, know that the animal kingdom has already taken a big hit from climate change. When facing a warmer world, animals basically respond in one of three ways. Some adapt their behaviors, others undergo rapid evolution and pass down beneficial traits, and still others straight up die out. To learn more about how climate change is impacting animals, we met up with research biologist Carl Larson. And what better location than the BC Wildlife Park in Kamloops, a rehabilitation center for orphaned and injured animals. Okay, Carl and friends, how is climate change affecting animals? There's a myriad number of ways that it could happen. And I think that's what people are really trying to work on right now is mm -hmm. understanding the different mechanisms by which climate change can affect animals. And we know it's gonna have an effect. Um, with some animals, it's very obvious. They're, the habitat's gonna change. Some animals are gonna be trapped in some ways. And what are all the different sort of general tools that animals might have to, to, to change up with climate change? You know, I, th I think of hibernation right away. Right. A big concept is migration. And, and people think of migration as, well, the birds fly back for the summer. Um, but migration in a climate change context, really you're thinking about how is the species going to move across the landscape, particularly as habitat changes. So we're still trying to figure a lot of this out. I think so. I mean, it's very obvious for some species, like say um, high latitude species that are going to have their range of habitats expand. We may see increases in their range, but then also some animals say that are high elevation on mountains, um, like hoary marmots that depend on alpine habitat. Mm -hmm. Well, that may disappear completely and so will the animals. Coming up, the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank is the second biggest bank failure in U.S. history. We'll tell you what that means for Canadian customers. Thanks for watching our commercial free live stream. Well, New Brunswick recently lost one of its most beloved artists. Members of the province's arts community say Leopold Fulham will be remembered for his unique personality, dedication and talent. Leopold Fulham was, we question, one of the most important New Brunswick artists uh, that we've ever seen. And he created this, this kind of amalgam of, of assembly and humour, but incredible technical sophistication and talent uh, in a language that no one else in the world worked like Leopold Fulham. The Acadian Peninsula was near and dear to his heart. He always came back every summer. It was really the time where he could really be himself and give of himself to his art. In fact, everything he ever made was made in Karaket. 
if Leopold had a place here, it's because of the openness of, of, of the community. The community embraces all kinds of people. And we were lucky enough that Leopold was loved here and stayed here and it made us a, a bitter small town. It was like a crossfade between uh, Elton John and uh, a famous Quebec writer who was kind of hippie. I, I always thought that Leopold, for me, was the first encounter of the intuition that, you know, adults were not all the same and um, that uh, Leopold somehow brought some magic in my life. So the house is like on itself a museum. I, I, I was actually, I was walking in the, the first time I walked in the house, I thought, okay, like, I'm in a, I'm in a film here. I already felt like there was, it was so rich that anywhere that I would put the camera, something would happen. And that's actually what happened. Leopold was a, a great artist. He was a ceramist, but he wasn't, uh, he was making a, a, a very uh, important difference between uh, doing pottery and doing ceramic as art. And so all his life, he sort of fought for this recognition of ceramic as art. He would say, I would have, I, would, I have to be the best and there has to be no mistake in order for people to consider it like art. I think that Leopold Flem's legacy will be, his, certainly he's one of the greatest visual artists and sculptors that Eastern Canada has ever had. And the fact that one of the world's great ceramic artists can come from the Acadian Peninsula is, is just a, a wonderful, testament to him, but also the cultural vitality and spirit of the region. Fallout from the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank continues today, with Canada's banking regulator now stepping in. The U.S. based financial firm, which specialized in lending to tech companies, collapsed last week after customers demanded their money back, concerned over the health of the bank. On Friday, the U.S. government stepped in to seize the bank's assets, which have been transferred to a new entity, leaving many companies, including some here in BC, scrambling to withdraw funds. We do keep money in Canada, so unlike some of our American colleagues, you know, we didn't, we weren't completely out of cash. I mean, we weren't in danger of missing payrolls, but that was the first thought. I mean, right. we were concerned about our employees, we are concerned about our ability to pay our suppliers um, who do important work for us. So, you know, we, like many people, thought, how are we going to get our money back into Canada? How are we going to get our money out, out of the U.S.? Ferguson says the scenario has energized Canada's tech sector to find a homegrown solution to offer services like those provided by SVB. The failure of Silicon Valley Bank south of the border continues to send shockwaves. For more on this, we're joined by Lucas Herrenbrook, an associate professor of economics at Simon Fraser University. Uh, Lucas, thanks for being on the show. A pleasure, Michelle. So to get us started, Lucas, point blank, how concerned should Canadians be about SVB's failure? As of today, not at all. There's two parts to this answer. One is um, it's the, the same kind of problem is very unlikely to happen to a Canadian bank. And second, as of Sunday, my understanding is that the U.S. federal government has actually guaranteed all deposits in SVB. So even if you had your money in SVB, you're going to get that money back. With the regulator taking control of the bank's Canadian assets, what does it mean for customers here in BC? So the bank's Canadian assets, that's very different from um, the so from the depositor side. So people make deposits to a bank, they give the bank money, 
And then on the other side, people might also take out loans from a bank. So SVB was making loans in Canada, and those are the assets that the Canadian regulator is now in charge of. But that means those are um, assets that people have to people owe money to SVB to. So that's the opposite of people having deposits in SVB, and they they wouldn't have done that um, on the Canadian side of the border. Of course, there's Canadian businesses that have operations in the U.S., and we know that many of those were uh, banking with SVB in the United States. Okay, and this situation has drawn a lot of comparisons to the 2008 financial crisis, of course. <laughs> what have we learned since that crash? Oh, we have learned so much. So the the big thing we have um, learned is that um, bank runs can still happen in the modern economy, but they're not going to happen when the banking system is very well regulated. So that's one thing that I think Canadians learned and were very proud of after 2008, when no Canadian bank failed, despite all sorts of problems south of the border. So as a result of the 2008 financial crisis, the United States had actually embarked on a program of tighter financial regulation, putting in a lot more rules on the banking system to make sure that A, something like this was unlikely to happen, and B, if it did happen, it wouldn't spread to other banks. And do you have a sense of why, despite all of those protections that were put in both in the US and in Canada, why yeah. we're still see seeing a failure today? Well, we're seeing this for two reasons. One, because um, SVB was too small in terms of um, their their size as a bank in order to um, be subject to the tightest kind of regulation. So the tightest kind of regulation affects the biggest kinds of banks because those are the most important kinds of banks and the ones that would do most harm to the economy if, if things went poorly. And those banks are very heavily regulated. Now, SVB was a slightly smaller bank that was less heavily regulated. But as you and your audience might be hearing right now, there's going to be some hot political discussion in the U.S. going on over whether the regulations were tight enough, even for medium-sized banks um, like SVB. And um, I wouldn't be too surprised to see them tighten. All right, a story we will continue to follow closely. Uh, Lucas Herrenbrook of SFU joining us today. Thanks, Lucas. Thank you. A rare surgery gives a woman newfound independence. That story coming up. Well, from the state of the world's atmosphere to the state of one town's water supply, some stories to tee up for you this week, starting with another key report on global warming, the third one prepared by a panel of distinguished scientists. This time, it's about what governments can do to slow the warming trend. The report's coming out tomorrow. Tonight, here's Eve Savory with what to expect. This company is drilling for sunshine, for the sun's energy stored in the Earth. In the first 1,000 feet of the Earth's surface, there's 50,000 times more energy stored than all the known oil and gas reserves in the world. It's called geothermal energy. Pipes will move the heat from the ground, concentrate it, and circulate it through the building. This project will supply 98% of the heating for these heritage houses being retrofitted in Vancouver. Pressure tested those ones. Since natural gas prices soared, so did Mueller's business. Five times what it was two years ago, and there's a side benefit. You avoid producing CO2 and other emissions from burning a fossil fuel. What's happening here is a microcosm of what an international group of scientists have been talking about all week in Ghana, cutting greenhouse gas emissions. And one of their conclusions is that countries can meet the goals they've set with known technologies. So it's a good news story in a way. There are a lot of things we can do. University of British Columbia's John Robinson is one of the report's authors. This isn't uh, wild-eyed uh, speculation, but technologies we can envisage and, and, and produce, we can create a world that is significantly less um, uh, uh, heavy on the emitting side. It emits significantly less carbon. That's a pretty exciting finding, I think. But some of the technologies the scientists support are controversial. Nuclear energy, for example. And then there's the very hot issue of trading emissions. Should industrialized nations get credit for reducing emissions somewhere else, say, by replacing coal plants in less developed countries? The scientists say there is a role. Also, they agree nations could get credit for protecting and planting forests to offset emissions. The last round of negotiations fell apart over exactly this. 
Danny Harvey teaches climate change and agrees with conditions. What planting forests will do is buy us time, but if we're not at the same time working hard to reduce our fossil fuel emissions, then we've wasted that opportunity. As for Mueller, he believes the public wants solutions. 30% of his customers buy the geothermal technology because it's green. They want to do something environmentally. If they can combine that with saving money, it's just a bonus. The scientists' report will be released tomorrow, and it will guide governments in their negotiations. Eve Savory, CBC News, Vancouver. The special rapporteur who will look into allegations of foreign meddling in Canada's elections has been named. David Johnston previously served as the Governor General. Rafi Bujikanyan has more on the announcement, which came down from the Prime Minister's office just a few hours ago. A little more than a week after saying he would appoint a special rapporteur to look into allegations of foreign interference into Canada's 2019 and 2021 elections, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has now said who that will be. David Johnston, a former Canadian Governor General, appointed by former Conservative Prime Minister Stephen Harper. Prior to that, Johnston was a law professor, and he currently serves as the president of the Leaders' Debates Commission, a role he will step down from in order to undertake his work as rapporteur, which will include making recommendations to government on combating foreign interference, along with a recommendation on whether or not to hold an independent public inquiry into the issue. Now, that's something the government has so far refused to undertake. Political opposition parties have been pushing for it. They also have been pushing for Katie Telford, the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff, to testify before Parliamentary Committee on this issue as well. That's something Liberal members have blocked so far and something that will continue next week at another committee meeting. It's unclear how long the special rapporteur's work will take to accomplish. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Ottawa. A groundbreaking surgery at a Montreal hospital has helped a Quebec woman regain the use of her hands after a spinal cord injury. She became quadriplegic, unable to use her lower body and her hands after breaking her neck two years ago. Alison Northcott has more on this rare surgery from Montreal. Right now I'm going to cut an apple. It's a task Jeanne Carrière thought she would never be able to do again on her own. Ready for some magic? Simply cutting an apple is a milestone. How do you feel for yourself when you can see yourself doing this now? Oh, it's touching. 27-year-old Carrière is quadriplegic. She lost the use of her lower body and hands after breaking her neck in 2021. It's a miracle that I'm alive. I'm paralyzed uh, under the neck to the toes. Look at that. But in recent months, Carrière has regained some independence after a life-changing surgery to bring back some of what she'd lost. As Carrière went into the operating room at Montreal's Maisonneuve-Rosemont Hospital last summer, our colleagues at Radio Canada's science program, Découvelt, followed along to capture it on camera. Here, two surgeons, one for each of Carrière's arms, perform a fine and minute surgery called a nerve transfer. What we are doing is basically using uh, these functional pathways, these nerves that are still working in the upper extremity and transferring them to muscles that have no more electricity. The delicate portion we do under the microscope where we will connect one nerve to the other nerve and that's done with very fine sutures, um, finer than a person's hair. You're kind of going around the broken area to a new area. Exactly. So we're basically bypassing the zone of injury by getting those nerves from above the level of the lesion to those nerves below the level of the lesion. Carrière's surgery takes nine hours. Then it takes months for the nerve fibers to grow into the muscle and for Carrière's body to adjust. The first time that I saw my finger move, the feeling was like to see 
uh, a child who is first step. It was the first step, first step in, into my new life. It's a world of difference. It's now been more than seven months since her surgery. Now it's unbelievable what my hands can do. I can eat uh, by myself in the more cleaner way. <laughs> um, I can brush my teeth, I can cook. This is what I have so far. Nerve transfers have become more common in recent years, says Dr. Ming Chan. But performing them on patients who are quadriplegic is newer, so there's a lot to learn. I think at the moment, it really is too early to say with certainty that, uh, you know, you'll work on the, you know, every patient that we uh, operate on. Hopefully, you know, in the next uh, uh, few years, you will get uh, more definitive answers on how this is working out. The Montreal surgeons who operated on Carrière have now done more than a dozen similar procedures. We're completely determined and convinced that this is a life-changing surgery for them and then knowing it uh, allows them more independence and not just for the short term but for the rest of their life. Carrière is thankful for that. And it was uh, very touching that everybody was working for my future. One of the most positive changes, she said, is being able to work again, writing a screenplay. She's grateful about how far she's come in her rehabilitation. It's all the little things that I wasn't able to do. Now that I can do it, it's like all my, my world has changed. Carrière is hoping for even more improvements in the months to come. Alison Northcott, CBC News, La Chute, Quebec. Accusations are flying back and forth between the U.S. and Russia over the downing of that American aircraft in the Black Sea. While the two sides can't agree on the cause, as Paul Hunter shows us, they do agree that tensions have reached a boiling point. It is the precise fate of one of these, a U.S. military Reaper drone raising more fears the war in Ukraine could now escalate. At the Pentagon, even the non-answers are sobering. As far as an act of war goes, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go there. It's Mark attack. Milley, chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, alongside U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, on what the U.S. says it knows and what it doesn't of what happened when that drone was somehow clipped mid-air by a Russian fighter jet off the coast of Crimea. The drone then crashing into the sea. The big question: Did Russia do it intentionally? Don't know yet. We know that the intercept was intentional. Uh, we know that the aggressive behavior was intentional. We also know it was very unprofessional and very unsafe. Uh, the actual contact of the uh, fixed-wing uh, uh, Russian fighter with our UAV, the physical contact of those two, not sure yet. Says the Pentagon, there is video not yet made public. And highlighting the seriousness of the incident, direct talks with Russia on all of it are ongoing. But Russia still denies mid-air contact. It says U.S. relations are now at a low point. Any incidents, said its foreign minister Sergei Lavrov, that provoke clashes between two nuclear powers always pose very serious risks. Milley underlined the U.S. has lately noticed a pattern of increased Russian aggression, said Austin. None of it will change U.S. behavior. The United States will fly and operate wherever international law allows. For the moment, what's left of the drone sits a kilometer and a half down at the bottom of the Black Sea. Says the U.S. its data was wiped as it plummeted. Says Russia it aims to find it and take it. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. A Pakistan court has postponed the arrest of former Prime Minister Imran Khan until tomorrow. Police have been trying to arrest him over charges he sold state gifts while in power and concealed assets. It set off a second day of violent clashes between Khan supporters and law enforcement. <laughs> Violence erupted after hundreds of protesters surrounded his home in Lahore today in an effort to prevent his arrest. Rocks and bricks were thrown and police fired back with tear gas and water cannons. Khan said he would support the summons and appear in court by Saturday, but police did not accept the offer. He denies any wrongdoing. 
Over 200 people dead in Malawi and the GL cyclone isn't fi finished. More on this natural disaster in southern Africa after the break. The camera gives me tremendous power. It's, it's sort of like uh, being able to draw in real time and seeing something happen in real time in, your, in that little black box, which is a camera. And I've enjoyed that power for uh, many, many years. My name is Gary Weeks. I'm from Fredericton, New Brunswick, and I am a black change maker. I was always the creative one in the family. I was the one who always drew from an early age, always did something sort of artistic. I was the one that was always, always with crayons and markers and drawing on desks at school. As Soon as I found out that I could take pictures and I could create art with a camera, I just never looked back and put down the paints, put down the brushes and decided to become a full-time photographer. There's sometimes there's struggles with being black, but there's so many, so many positives with being black that I found in my life. I've been black, so to speak, in New York. I've been black in England, and I'm now black in Canada. And the whole idea is that in all of those places, I've been the same Gary that I've always been. I would like to show that everybody, no matter what, walk of life you've come from, if you've got a joy or if something gives you joy, pursue that joy. Let's look further beyond what our parents or our peers tell us that we should do and just do whatever makes us happy because bottom line, if you get out of this life and, and you leave this life and you're happy with what you've done in it, I think that's the achievement. I'm proud of the fact that uh, I've raised three kids and three beautiful, dynamic women. Uh, I'm proud of the fact that uh, I've been in the industry for 40 years, I know nothing else. And I've enjoyed all the different facets of photography. As a change maker, if I can bring more people into the artistic community, or bring more people to realize that, yes, there are other ways of looking at life, then by the so-called conventional means, then to be a change maker would be a great achievement for me. Land Back is a CBC original podcast where we uncover land theft in Canada and look at how Indigenous people are taking it all back. Land Back is out now on CBC Listen or wherever you get your podcasts. More than 200 people are dead as a record-setting cyclone batters several countries in southern Africa. Cyclone Freddy is carving a path of destruction from Malawi to Mozambique. As Lindsay Duncombe reports, many fear there will be more deaths. This is what happens when one of the most sustained storms on record hits one of the world's most vulnerable populations. And people are gone. People are gone, things are gone, everything is gone, it's gone down. Entire communities washed away. Blend of bodies down there in the mud there. Cyclone Freddy's death toll in Mozambique and Malawi is officially more than 200. That number is expected to rise. 
So far, we have recovered 30 bodies, he says, but we are not yet done. Tens of thousands are displaced. This woman saved her children, but lost everything else. I have no food, blanket, clothing, she says. Scientists are still calculating the data, but it is believed Freddy was the longest lasting cyclone ever. The power of its winds having more energy than an entire U.S. hurricane season. Cyclone Freddy developed near Australia in early February, picking up strength as it crossed the Indian Ocean to make landfall first in Madagascar, then Mozambique, and remarkably strengthening again for a devastating hit to the north. Because of climate this climate scientist grew up where the cyclone hit in Mozambique and says a warming planet is making storms worse. So it might be that uh, because of increasing of sea surface temperatures and increases in moisture, it was uh, there was a perfect condition for the tropical cyclones to continue to uh, live in the ocean and travel to the land uh, and cause all the damage that we are seeing now. Mozambique's coastline means it is likely to bear the brunt of a changing climate, a cruel fact of geography when you consider how little the impoverished country has contributed to climate change. Freddie's aftermath will make existing challenges in the region worse. There are concerns about cholera, and people who had little have so much less. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, London. Torrential rains triggered flash floods in Turkey's southern eastern provinces. This rescue, one of many such efforts in southeastern Turkey, where torrential rains are washing out a region already devastated by massive earthquakes last month. At least 14 people have died in the flooding and several others are missing. The rising waters have torn apart major roadways, many already damaged. The government is urging everyone to stay away from the flood zone. Ever wonder what aristocrats in the 1750s wore? After the break, we'll take a look at a Museum of Vancouver exhibit showcasing centuries-old fashion. This house may be small, but the people building it have some big hopes. This is the prototype, 300 square feet with one bedroom, a bathroom with a stand-up shower, and a combined kitchen living room. The plan is to eventually build 30 of them over the next three years. I think it's amazing, really. I don't think there's any other words to say it. Such a big shortage on, house, on housing here in PI, so I think it's going to help so many people. Lots of people are going to benefit from this. The provincial government is providing $60,000 in materials per tiny home. The building will be put together by people in various training programs put on by the Construction Association. Instead of building mini barns and, and small little projects like that, we, we sat down, uh, the minister and I and his department, and, and thought about, you know, what, what can we do to help, and, and this is what we come up with. Sam Sanderson says there has been lots of buzz around tiny homes. These ones will also be net zero. And having them built by construction workers in training, that too is attracting attention. I've taken a lot of calls from my counterparts across the country and saying, you know what, how do we get involved in this? How can, how can we do it as well? Here at the Summerside campus of Holland College, students from multiple programs have been busy working on two new homes, from plumbing, electrical, carpentry and HVAC programs. Students have been building houses as part of their training for years. Usually they are sold at the end of the program. But this year, the province has purchased them. We thought it was a great idea. We were on, on board right away. Um, it's, a, it's only two homes, so it's only a, a drop in the bucket, but it, it's something. It's something we can do to help. Students here also like that the houses will soon become homes for islanders needing social housing. Definitely hits close to home. Known a lot of people that uh, have almost been um, homeless, I guess you could say. Yeah. Makes me really happy, um, and it's relieving knowing that these aren't just going to be sitting somewhere um, vacant, they're actually going to be put to good use and uh, hopefully change some people's lives. 
providing new homes, and adding more skilled labor, all in the swing of a hammer. Nancy Russell, CBC News, Charlottetown. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. On March 30th, join Angela Starrett at the Alumni UBC webinar on Indigenous youth, nurturing the next generation. Hear from three Indigenous speakers who mentor Indigenous youth to share knowledge in their communities and beyond. Register at alumni.ubc.ca and never miss an episode of your favourite CBC drama or comedy with the free CBC GEM app. Check it out at gem.cbc.ca. NASA has unveiled the spacesuit it plans to use for its next mission to the moon. The gear would be worn by astronauts during walks on the lunar surface for the upcoming Artemis III moon mission. And this is going to be a huge improvement over the Apollo suits. The Apollo suits didn't have many of these types of joints that we've put in this suit, so the astronauts will be more comfortable, have an easier time walking, performing tasks, um, getting down to like to pick up a rock or something like that, or use a geology tool. The suits will be sleeker, designed for greater mobility, and the new helmet improves visibility. It'll provide more protection from the moon's harsh environments and extreme temperatures, designed to reflect heat and keep future moonwalkers cool. The final version will be, made, will be white and made of mylar and Kevlar. NASA says it's aiming to land two astronauts on the moon's south pole in late 2025. Finally tonight, a new show launches this week at the Museum of Vancouver. It's called Dressed for History, and it's a collection of women's fashion from the 1700s to the 2000s. Lisa Christensen got a sneak peek of the clothing and the stories they tell. Dress for History has a subtitle, which is Why Costume Collections Matter. Why do they matter? They matter because, well, history matters. We have to learn from the past, hopefully, so that we learn to try and improve things and create a better future than the past. One of our major purposes in doing the exhibition was to try and get support for the establishment of a museum of clothing and textiles. This is the oldest one. It's uh, English. I got it from a family in Victoria. It's mid part of the 18th century. The fabric certainly is from the 1750s. It has a lot of volume, but it has no weight to it. So it's crisp, it stands away, but it doesn't weigh much of anything. And the woman's supposed to float. That's one of the reasons it's clear of the ground. She's supposed to look like she's floating on air. So who would have worn this? It would have been worn by a relatively well-to-do person. Why does fashion get such a bad rap as being sort of, you know, sort of foolish or not very important? Well, frankly, probably traditionally because it was more conspicuous with women. Mm. And there's always been this sense that women are frivolous. And maybe we're more aware of that now than we ever have been but also fashion tended to be an amusement for idle rich people and that has changed as well. So we have jumped ahead centuries. We have. We were a 1957 to 1968 establishment of counterculture. The whole concept of fashion changes in 1917 for Canadian women in particular because it's the first time they could vote in a federal election. Suddenly it's the modern world and it's not perfect 
but it's a step. What's happened now is the clothing has become more conspicuously functional, not so much ab about objectification and debilitation. So in the 50s, there's a certain kind of humor attached to it, and that really comes with the 60s and hippie stuff. And this is about handcrafting. This isn't about mass production. It's about a unique garment, and it's natural fiber, and she painted it herself. And then the contrast to that is punk. So this is an outfit, outfit by Vivian Westwood, the horrible poo-poo pants that I can't stand, and one of her t-shirts. You know, when people do come, what are you hoping that they learn from this exhibit? What I'm wanting people to get out of this, though, is that the stuff is beautiful or it's interesting, but also that fashion is entertaining. Especially in Vancouver, people feel that if you get dressed up, it's pretentious. But the truth is that it isn't so much pretentious as entertaining. And getting dressed up is fun. There's nothing wrong with looking good unless it's the only thing you concentrate on. And that's our show for tonight. Thanks for being with us tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. For news anytime, you can visit our website. That's cbcnews.ca slash bc. You can also watch this program and many others on our free app, CBC Gem. And Janella Hamilton will be right here at 11 with your late local news. Good night. <laughs>